morning and welcome to Movement Church Online. Hey, if you haven't already done it, go ahead and click the subscribe button next to this video so you can get notifications when we post new videos and content. My name is Mark and I want to welcome you to our online Sunday morning service. It's Vision Sunday and it's also Mother's Day. And so you'll hear more about those things here in a second. We want to celebrate what God is calling us to do in this next year. We also want to celebrate the moms in our lives. But first, we want to start off our morning with music. We like to start off by singing and, and worshiping God. We want to take a moment just to quiet our hearts and look at who God is and what he's calling us to do. So let's take a moment, sing together. You can engage with this process. Go ahead and sing out wherever you are, in your car or watching on your phone, and we can worship together as a church.
Well, as I already mentioned, today is Mother's Day, and so we want to celebrate all of the moms, all of the women of Movement Church. I was afraid that I wouldn't be able to do that and be very cute, so I brought some friends along with me. This is my son Malachi, he's 12, Canaan is 10, Mercy is 7, and Zion is 5. And I just want to ask them some questions about their mom as we, as we celebrate moms here. Malachi, what is your favorite thing about your mom? makes me breakfast and the bacon's usually really good. She's a great cook of bacon. I hope you take that to heart, moms. Kanan, uh, if you had to answer this question, what do you think that your mom does better than any mom in the world? She makes the best sesame noodles. The best sesame noodles. Oh, isn't this so true? All of our answers are relating to cooking. Maybe that's a problem. I don't know. Mercy, what is it that, that makes mom, your mom, happier than anybody? I make her cards. You, you like to draw and make cards for her? That is yeah. awesome. And Zion, what is it that, that you see, what, what makes mom mad or sad? I love cooking and I don't clean my room. You don't? Sometimes you don't clean your room? That is shocking. I find that shocking. Well, anyway, we want to celebrate the moms who, who make us food, the moms who don't make us food, the moms who play with us in the backyard, the moms who work hard every day at their jobs. We love everything about you moms and the way that you sacrifice. We are thankful for you and we are grateful for you. In fact, guys, why don't we say Happy Mother's Day here quick to the moms of Movement Church, the women in our lives, and the people that have the heart of a mom. Happy Happy Mother's Day here on three. Ready? One, two, three. Happy Mother's Day! Hey, we have a Mother's Day tradition that we like to do family dedications and just uh, talk about how we can raise our children uh, in partnership with the church to, to know, love, and serve God. And so I want to toss to this video here. We have a family that's going to participate in that this week. Check out this video. All right, well, we are here uh, with the Wysong family, and we want to celebrate family dedications today. Guys, can you go ahead and uh, introduce the, the members of your family, even those who might be new? <laughs> yeah, I'm Matt. This is Mackenzie. This is our new baby, Elodie. All right, and uh, I, I don't know that Elodie was supposed to, to be here with us yet. I think she arrived a little early, so maybe tell us, tell us that story. Everybody's doing okay, though? <laughs> Yeah, we're doing okay, but she surprised us and came a full month early, so her due date isn't until May 18th, so maybe we'll throw her a mini, a mini party on May 18th. For All being right. here. <laughs> yeah, I've, I've talked to some of our other uh, pregnant couples at Movement, and they've started referring to it. They're like, we hope we don't get Y-songed, so that's, <laughs> that's what an early arrival is now. Hey, that, we what, hope people prepare yeah. <laughs> more power. <laughs> Yeah, but no, what a what a blessing. She is beautiful there. She's got the got the sweet outfit on and she's I you guys are already great parents because you've trained her to to be asleep or to act like she's asleep during this. And that's that's impressive. That's impressive. So, well, hey, we uh, we want to uh, celebrate family dedication today. Uh, this is a, a tradition. There, there are churches who believe in baptizing infants, and and that's uh, that's not something we celebrate. We never want to mock that, but uh, we, we don't tie today to salvation in any way, but we we think it's our job to uh, come alongside families and celebrate when God gives them a child, and to uh, just to to help them with the patterns we see in Scripture. And so throughout Scripture, we see different instances where where God would say uh, that, that children are a blessing, where he would say they're an incredible uh, resource that he's given us to be stewards and managers of. And, and he asked people in the Old Testament and the New Testament to uh, raise their children to know Jesus. He asked us to uh, keep our, our eyes on him and keep the eyes of our children on him and to raise our children uh, with the discipline of the Lord. And so I just wanted to uh, highlight some of those things today. I know you've read through some passages we, we gave you, but I, I wanted to ask uh, this morning if, if it's your desire to, to dedicate Elodie uh, before God and to uh, just commit alongside our church to, to raise her to know, love, and serve God. Yes. It is. Yes. yes. It is. It is. All right. And this is a little different, obviously, over a, a Zoom call and a recording. Uh, but I know that that we as a church know you and love you. And so I wanted to ask anyone who might be watching this, if you've got the the the, the Y Songs number, if you want to uh, text them, if you want to Facebook them, if you want to DM them on Instagram, and and just tell them that that you want to commit to do that alongside them, that you want to see their family be a family 
uh, that proclaims the name of Jesus, that you want to walk alongside them and, and help them. Uh, we always jokingly use the quote that it takes a village. And so if you want to say that you're a part of their village, we would commit to that. Normally when we're in person, we have people stand uh, and commit to that with you. Uh, we can't do that today. I, I would stand up if I could, but I want you to know that you have a church that's walking alongside you. And so we want to say that we also uh, want your, we want Elodie and, and every child that you'll have to know, love, and, and serve Jesus. So let me, let me pray for the, your family today, and we want to commit her to the Lord today. God, thank you so much for Elodie, Lord, and thank you for her safe arrival. Thank you uh, just for, for how well uh, the White Songs are doing, Lord. Thank you for, for Matt and uh, for Mackenzie and the way that we've uh, just been a part of their story and seeing you grow their family and, and uh, mature them and change them over the last years. God, we uh, we want to be a church that walks alongside them. And, and so, God, we pray for Elodie's salvation early. We pray that she will know what it means to surrender her life to you and follow you. And we pray that we can see her take steps uh, to surrender her life and to be a leader and to, to do ministry and, and to be an evangelist. And so, God, we pray toward those things. We pray for uh, every interaction that she'll have in movement kids and, and the way that she'll grow up in movement students and, and different ways that, that people will be able to, to bless her and, and, uh, and disciple her. And so, Lord, we, we pray toward that and we just commit her to you today. It's in the name of Jesus I pray. Amen. Amen. All right. Yes, well, thanks a lot. Thanks for joining us today. And uh, we hope to see you in person soon. Hey, Movement Church. I'm so glad you're joining us today as we finish up our series called You Can't Have It All. And uh, it's our fourth week. The first week we we talked about really what does it mean to be a follower of Jesus? And uh, the language we used was apprenticing him. And then uh, the last two weeks we spent some time kind of unpacking what some spiritual blockades have been in our faith that, that really kind of move us away from Jesus and our intimacy with him. Uh, we talked about hurry and the, the, how that can cause problems in our busyness and uh, really rush us and not be able to be present. And then we also talked about contentment and uh, the, the lack of the ability to be content. We constantly want more and want more things, more, more love, more uh, money and whatever it may be. And so uh, today I want to talk about the last, uh, the last of this series. And uh, it, uh, when we can start talking about it, I don't think you'll be super surprised. In fact, at some point, you might want to just turn off the TV. Um, and, uh, but I want to give you some, some clarity on this topic. I noticed that it, it's, it's serious and we must take it to heart. In fact, in the four Gospels of Jesus, the stories of Jesus, 10% of all of the verses talk about this specific topic that we're going to talk about. In uh, Jesus' 38 parables, 16 of them refer to this topic. And in the entire narrative of the Bible, there's 500 verses on prayer. There's less than 500 about faith. And there's more than 2,000 about this topic. So this is all throughout the Bible. It's clearly important. And uh, maybe you've already figured it out. Maybe you kind of have an idea. But uh, I want to move into a passage. We'll talk about it, and you'll figure it out as we go. But I'd love for you to turn to Matthew chapter 6. If you notice, this is a part of what is called the Sermon on the Mount. The Sermon on the Mount is essentially Jesus giving a, a longer message to his disciples. And then the backdrop of them is a bunch of people that are listening and and what, what the foundation of it is, is really this statement that he says several times. He says, you have heard it said, but I say to you, blank. And what he's doing is he's, he's pulling all the stuff they had known, and he's calling them to something deeper and much greater, that, that he is the, the, the fulfillment of that into something much greater. And uh, I think the best analogy for this, if you're a math fan, this is like the one time I think I'll ever talk about math in a sermon, but here you go, here's your chance, is like math. You, you, maybe I remember growing up in eighth grade and I, I started this thing called algebra and found out, you know what, maybe it is math. It, it, it has some letters, which is weird, but it still seems like it's math. And then they're like, you know what, this is so in, uh, so ridiculous that we're going to make you take two years of it. And so I took algebra two. And then the year after that, they have this crazy, wicked thing called geometry. And it's like, eh, like algebra with, with shapes and, and, I don't know, segments of things and and then as if that wasn't bad enough and that wasn't weird enough, then they make up this math, I swear it's made up, it's not real, called trigonometry. In trigonometry, I can't even tell you what the difference between geometry, I think it's like more hard math. But anyways, I did, I took it, trigonometry. And so a lot of us, we stopped there, right? We graduate high school and we're like, ooh, praise the Lord, I am done with math for the rest of my life. Some of you maybe went to college and you didn't, you didn't have to take it and you're like, yes. But there's some of us, like myself, 
that entered into the dark depths of the math world. And if you know what I'm talking about, it was the next step on the math ladder to the dark depths, and it is calculus. Now, if you've taken calculus, you just know. I think there's it's it's a it's a following of people that just get it. Calculus is ridiculous for two reasons. The first is that it is essentially like you're learning another language. You're like, oh, I took Spanish in high school. You say, I took calc, it's the same thing. Calculus is legitimately a language. It's its own thing. You start looking at it and you're like, this doesn't make any sense. The second reason why calculus is, is ridiculous is because it requires you to know everything else at a proficient level in order to do it. Meaning that if you slacked off in geometry in ninth grade because you're a freshman and you don't care about things, it's going to affect you when you take calculus. If you want to be good at calculus, you have to be good at algebra, geometry, whatever trigonometry is, you got to be good at all of them. And in the same way, the Sermon on the Mount is this. Jesus is saying, hey, you took all these maths, you understand algebra, whatever. This is the law you've given. But now I'm calling you something much deeper, much greater. And it culminates all of it together. It's an important kind of um, holistic understanding. And yes, it is math, even though it's way different than what I'm saying. For example, he says, hey, you know what? Some of you might know, like, the physical act of a sin, you steal something with your hand, is wrong. But I'd actually say, even in your heart, if you thought that, if you wanted to steal that, if you wanted to take something from someone else, that is a sin. He pulls it much deeper into calculus. And he says, hey, you know what? Uh, let's say that you love people. Great. Okay, even the worst of people love some people, especially those who are like them. I'm telling you, you know what? Love everyone. Love the enemies, the people that you really have a hard time loving, that are frustrating, that you don't even deserve your love. Love those people. That's the calculus of love. He talks about, hey, maybe you've been wrong. Maybe something's been unfair. Maybe there's been an injustice in your life, and you should have the right to retaliate. Well, I'm going to let God handle that, and you're just going to love them in the process. You're going to pursue peace and remediation. And he's basically just calling us to just this deeper, deeper transformation of following him, that when we apprentice Jesus, that we become more and more like him in our journey. And in Matthew 6, we're going to get into another area of our life that I believe that we are never done growing in, that we constantly have to reevaluate and think through the lens of Christ. And uh, in this passage, we're going to talk about money. So if you would like to stay on TV with me, that would be the most kind. Hopefully, don't drop off here. Um, but we're going to read Matthew chapter 6, verse 19. It says, Don't store up treasures here on earth, where moths eat them and rust destroys them, and where thieves break in and they steal. Instead, store your treasures in heaven, where moths and rust cannot destroy, and thieves do not break in and steal. Wherever your treasure is, there your heart is also, your eye is like a lamp that provides light for your body. When your eye is unhealthy, your whole body is filled with light. But when your eye is unhealthy, your whole body is filled with darkness. And if the light, if, and if the light you think you have is actually darkness, how deep that darkness is. No one can serve two masters, for you'll hate one and love the other. You'll be devoted to one and despise the other. You cannot serve and be in God and be enslaved to money. And so what Jesus here is he's saying, hey, here's money, here's God. You can't serve both of these with a full heart. You, you can't say, well, I want my money piece, I want my God piece, and I'll just, I'll just, you know, I'll serve two different kingdoms. Or you, you'll even maybe say, you know what, I'm going to jump down Jesus' lane, and I'm just going to attach a little bit of my own personal success along with that, and we'll just kind of ride those together. He's saying, no, like, those are those are incompatible. You can't, you can't love both of these. And you might ask, well, what does it mean to love money? And it, I'm not here to give you a rigid, this is a percent you give here, this is I mean, you get away. What I'm here to say is, honestly, it's like, how, what's your desires of your heart? A modern way to say that, he says, for where your treasures is, there your heart will be also. The modern way to say it is, where your checking account statement is, there your heart will be also. It's funny. It's like, oh, but that's really true. Like, if you had the ability and you were, like, vulnerable enough, like, hey, Trey, here's my checking account. I could, other than your bills, utilities, whatever, I could probably figure out, oh, wow, like, you really love Starbucks. Oh, wow, like, you go to Target way too much. Whatever it may be, I can see the desires of your heart, just like you can see mine. And we have to be honest in evaluating. Jesus says these two are incompatible. The desire of our heart can either be God or it can be money. It doesn't mean that we just, oh, I don't need money. I'm not going to have money. I'm not going to have a job. I'm not going to have a house. I'm not going to have anything. That's a little bit too far. But what he is saying is that the lens at which you see things, that lens is, is honestly our generosity. That, that if we have a pink lens in our eyes, everything we see is pink. If we are really loving money, everything that we do will be consumed by money, whether we like it or not. And he says, the worst of you are the people who think you're light, but you're really in the dark. He said, how terrible of a darkness is that? Now, I know a lot of you maybe have had bad experiences with the church and money, or 
you, you know, you've given this nonprofit and you found out a penny of your dollar went to what you actually thought it would go to, or you found out that this church secretary was embezzling money, or or this pastor makes five hundred thousand dollars a year, and you you like, I don't want to talk about money in church ever. I think they're a bunch of corrupt people. I am not here to talk about that. What I'm here to talk about is the words of Jesus. And I, what I want you to do is try to weed through maybe the trauma, the hurt, and suffering that you've experienced with that. And I'm not here to say that it didn't happen. It's not real. But I think we, we need to realize today that, that Jesus is talking about money, that it's important to him, that it should be important to us. That it's the narrative of the Bible. We can't escape it. I can't not talk about money because it's literally everywhere in the Bible. And, uh, and this is going to bring us to our series, is that we, we realize in this statement, you can't serve God and be enslaved to money, is that we can't have it all. You just can't have it all. You cannot serve both God and money. You'll love one, you'll hate the other. It's funny, because if I had a dollar for every time I heard this, you know, a follower of Jesus say, hey man, you can't serve God, you can't serve money. And then later that day, I hear their plan about how in their 30s or 40s, they want to be a millionaire, and they want to be able to not have to work, and they want to be a great father, great dad, and be present and do the do the things they want to do, uh, I'd be a millionaire. I, I, I've heard this story so many times. And what they really want to do is they want to, they want God and they want their own kingdom and they want to put them in tandem and they want to say, like, we're like, oh yeah, I'm following God, but I want my business to like really be like in part of that. And and what happens is this plan includes them most likely working 60 to 80 hours a week, neglecting their community, their loved ones, and family. Yeah, it includes them trying to leverage relationships with people for clients and money and, and business. And, uh, and I'm just going to say, this is, this is not the way of Jesus. This is not what it means to apprentice Jesus. Because you don't take a pause of your following of Jesus to, to pursue it in the future when things are better. Meaning that you don't wait, well, I'm in my 30s, then I'll really give. I'll be out of debt. I'll, uh, I'll have be a high-paying job. I won't be in my current circumstance. I already have my boat. I'll be able to give then. That's actually completely counterintuitive of what Jesus is saying here. He's saying, no, in your instance now, what is your call in your heart of following him to be deeper and deeper in, in generosity. And, and it's not to wait till a point where we're better. It's actually now. And, and I'm not here to tell you how much it should be, what it should be, where it should be. I'm just here to show you, I think Jesus is saying, this isn't something that we can just wait. We don't give a decade of our life to loving money and then all of a sudden say, we're going to love God now. That's not how it works. And Jesus is concerned with this. He's not saying get rid of money completely. He, he had, they had to buy things. Uh, like he had stuff. He actually worked a job for 30 years and made money, income, like he did. Um, and so like, there's that part of that. But it's money is more about being a tool or a resource than it is being this trophy that we strive for that, that skews our lens in the way that we see things. Uh, and you think about it, like money is powerful. Like you, you can't deny that. If you look at the top grossing industry, it's the sex industry, and they make a ton of money. Think about sports. That's a huge money maker. Think about social media. All they're doing is giving you ads, trying to... Have you buy stuff? Money is power. And at this time, they absolutely knew it because at the Roman time, the way they would do things is they'd go to a small town or area or country and they'd say, hey, uh, we're not going to kill you if you give us taxes. And that's how Rome became so powerful because they had so much wealth. They were a huge military. It seemed like they were generous. And they used the money as power. Money has power. And the thing is, Jesus knows this. He knows that money is captivating people's hearts at this time. He calls a tax collector to his disciples, and he even uses a parable, the parables in Matthew 13, he says, the kingdom of God, the kingdom of heaven, is like a treasure, it's like a treasure, that a man discovered hidden in a field, and in his excitement, he hid it again, sold everything he owned to get enough money to buy the field where the treasure was. He says later, it's like a pearl, it's like, it's like a merchant on the lookout for great pearls, when he discovers this pearl, he sold everything he owned, and he bought it. When we get a glimpse of the kingdom of God, we, we, we should really be asking ourselves, what needs to go so that I can have it? What do I need to abandon in my life so that I can have it? And that's what taking up your cross means. Dying yourself, taking up your cross, is denying all of your things, everything you have, and giving it to Jesus and saying, I want it. I want to sell it all for it. And like I said, it doesn't mean that you just sell everything, your house, your clothes. If you have a family, that you just abandon the providing of them for them and Things like that, but what we realize is that when we follow Jesus, we are called to potentially give up everything. It's not that we necessarily will, but if someone was to take all of your money or a lot of your stuff, would you be willing to do that for the sake of Christ? Would you be willing to do that? Not would it happen, but that's the, that, that's the type of questions that get in our heart of generosity. Are we willing to lose those things? Or are they secure? Are we, we become anxious? Are we worried? Where is our heart really lying in the midst of that? 
And this is what plays into apprenticing Jesus, like we talked about in the first week. There's three parts of apprenticing Jesus. The first is that we be with Jesus. And if you realize, if we're with Jesus, we're in his presence, if we even read the scriptures about Jesus, that he talks about money a lot, that he knows being generous is, is a part of the kingdom of God. If we become like him, the second one, that means that the more we become like him, the more that we'll have his teaching, his posture, and his understanding of what it means to be generous, that we give to those who are needy. We spend time and energy with those who need it. And the third one is that, that he would do, uh, that, that he would do, uh, we think about what, we, what would he do if he were us? Um, and and, and if, if Jesus were me and where I live with my house and my family and the money that I make, that God has given me, what do I do with that? What, what would Jesus be doing with that? Where would he be giving his money? How would he be seeing money in terms of his life? And those are the three things that we, we, we translate into apprenticing him because it's a part of following Jesus. Generosity is, it's the heart of the gospel. We think about what is the cross? What is Jesus dying for us? What is the good news? The good news is that a God who didn't have to gave his life up generously for an undeserving people like us. That they didn't have to do that. That's the root of the gospel, generosity. So from that, outflowing of that, a love for us, we then love others with the same generous heart, that we want to help people see the kingdom of God here and now where we are in the same way that we've experienced it in the love of God. That's why Jesus talks about money. That's why he uses parables, because it attaches to the power of things that we see around us. And, and I think a lot of us need reframing around this. Maybe we've been grown up in church, we've, we've heard the word tithe, that we've, we've uh, well, I give 10% and I just do that till I die. And, and a little bit of background on tithe. Tithe is, is not a New Testament thing. It's actually an Old Testament thing. And it was created for the Israelites. See, there was 12 tribes, and God gave 11 of them land to, to, to sow and to, to make crops and cattle and all that. And then the 12th tribe, he put in charge of the temple and, and the worship and the sacrifices and all that. And that was a full-time job. So the Levites, it says in Numbers 18, verse 23 and 24, that they, they didn't get an allotment of land. But he says, instead, I have given the Israelites tithes which have been presented as sacred offerings to the Lord, to the Levites. It says here, notice that the, 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 the tithes of the Israelites were not for the Levites initially. They were actually a sacrifice to the Lord. So we know that from the beginning of the Bible, the narrative of God, that uh, part of our worship is giving back to him. It's being generous to, in, in response to what he has done for us. We give back the things that he's blessed us with, that we're a good steward. It's the same within the garden. God tells Adam and Eve to be fruitful, to multiply, to to name animals, to, to, to cultivate that, to be generous in that. And he's a generous God from the beginning until now. And so the original intent of this tithe, we, we've kind of binded. And it's funny, we think it's 10%. And uh, if you do some research, you could really get into some scholars arguing that it's maybe more so 20 to 30%. And I don't want to make you sweat. You're not like, oh boy, that's a lot of money. But I'm just trying to point out here that, that, um, that the way that we think about this is like the algebra, the trigonometry, the geometry. And we need to realize that we're, in, we're in the calculus now. Like Jesus is calling us to be a more generous people than even before. And like I said, I'm not here to give you a number. Well, like you got to get 40% of all your all everything you make. But what I'm here to say is we're never done in our spiritual formation in terms of generosity. The world we live in, in the West, we have no shortage of things that we're trying to consume that we're trying to consume. So I'd say that it's extremely helpful for us to continually remember, how can I be more generous? How can I love people more? And how can I give more? How can I be more generous? And and so I think the main question I want to ask you that I want you to wrestle with, and I hope you do actually wrestle with it, is what's my next step in being more generous? What's my next step in apprenticing Jesus in terms of generosity? What does that look like for me? Is it maybe you've never given to a local church and you didn't and you just haven't done that. Maybe you need to do that. Maybe you, you give infrequently and you're like, you know, I need to create a rhythm. Maybe you're in debt and you don't trust giving money to the church while you're in debt, but you need to be like, you know what? I need to trust God first with my first share. Maybe you have someone who's like a Levi who's working full time for an organization or is across the country or is in America but doesn't have support and they need they need support. Maybe they need, you, you need to, you feel called to help them. Or maybe it's someone who's struggling right now in this time and they need a washer and a dryer or a uh, a rent paycheck, it, you know, you can think of it. It's there's so many opportunities for us, and what it does is it shows people the gospel. I know the gospel is not money, but the gospel is generosity, and generosity can be often be shown in America and the world we live in through money because money has power in other people's lives, which is why Jesus talks about it so much. So my job here is not to judge you, but I just want you to get thinking about this. What do the words of Jesus mean in my own heart? I think a good hypothetical for us is. 
everybody's been receiving stimulus checks and maybe you haven't gotten yours yet, but whether it was 1200 or 2400 or how many, you know, nine kids, it could be five grand, whatever, you know, and maybe you didn't really need that money. A hypothetical would be, would you give that money to someone if you knew that they would follow Jesus because of that? That would be a stepping stone to their um, coming before Jesus. Would you do it? Would you give that money away? What if it was $8,000? Would you do it? What, what, what if you have a kid and you know that you can actually, the amount of money that you give can help them love Jesus their entire life? Would you give, would you pay a million dollars? Would you pay a hundred thousand? How much would you pay? And we start to think about that. And it's not that I'm like looking for a specific number. What I'm saying is that, do we ever think that, that our being generous can be a kingdom seed that we're sowing in the lives of others? In fact, it talks about this throughout the entire gospels and all, and a lot of Paul's letters is, in 2 Corinthians, he says, hey, you sow a little bit, you're only going to get a little bit in return. You sow a ton, you're going to reap a ton. It's not prosperity gospel, you're going to be more blessed, but it's that the more generous you are, the more that it affects people, the more people it touches. It's, it's the calling of the kingdom is to love those around us radically because we've been loved first. And so I think that whole like, stimulus check is just an idea of like, oh, I've seen money, would you be willing to give it away? The even deeper understanding of what it means to follow Jesus is, would you give that money away if you knew that person was just going to squander it? I don't think I would. I'd be like, well, I'm going to give this something back. I'm going to invest it, whatever. That's a dumb investment. But you realize that that's what God did for us, right? That he, if you look in that, we can, you can read that on your own time. Luke 15 talks about the prodigal son. God gave his inheritance and we squandered it. And then we came back and we're like, I'm sorry. And what is, you know, he, he opens his arms and he calls his son and he brings us back into his kingdom. And that's the gospel for all of us. And, and I think we need to remember that, that money we have is not really ours. That it's just a means, an opportunity for us to share the kingdom, to be generous, because it's rooted in, in the gospel of Jesus. And, and in 2 Corinthians, it talks about that, that Jesus doesn't want us to be reluctant givers or in response to pressure, meaning I am not trying to pressure you here but that he loves a cheerful giver who gives cheerfully to him. And the reason why that matters is because the cheerfulness that we give is out of an outpouring of our understanding of the gospel. And that's why a mark of a mature follower of Jesus, one who is radically in love, in him, uh, in love with him, is their ability to be generous, their amount of generosity, their level of generosity, because your heart and treasure, there they are. And if we understand the gospel and how God's been generous to us, we're much more willing to be generous to others because we want people to see the gospel through the way that we embody it, that we live it out, and that we give generously to people. And so I just want to ask you the question, what is my next step to being more generous? You don't just plateau and then coast. You need to be willing to be like, how can I give more than it hurts, but how can I give cheerfully? If I'm not giving cheerfully, what, what, am I, what am I struggling with in the gospel? Why am I, am I living based on works? Am I trying to work my way to God and Him love me? Or am I admitting or am I realizing that God has loved me before anything I could do? He loves me unconditionally, regardless of what I do. And that, that's so encouraging that I, I want to be the same. I want to be just as generous as He was to me. And that's the gospel. And that's, that's how we need to understand generosity. So I encourage you to think through that question this week as we process. And uh, if you read Luke, 15, it's a great story that will help you understand that. That generosity that God gives you, that's the gospel that's accessible to you and to all of us. Would you pray, Lord, thanks for your generous heart. Lord, I just pray that we would be more generous. I pray that, Father, you would just give us moments to be generous, opportunities to be generous. Help us to, to just understand and remember your gospel and how generous you were for us. We love you and we pray all these things in your son's name. Amen. Well, hey, Movement Church, once a year, we have a Sunday that we call Vision Sunday. We like to get together. We like to look at the year behind us, but also look to the year ahead of us. We have a fiscal and vision calendar that starts on July 1st. And so every year, our elders, our leadership get together, and we say, what is God calling us to accomplish in this next year? How can we get to where he wants us to get? What are the initiatives, the programs, the staff members, and the budget that it would take to get there? And once we kind of know those things, we, we have Vision Sunday. It's really just a family meeting where we can get together and say, hey, here's where we're going. Let's get behind this. And so today, I want to just take a moment and, and talk about where we're going. But first, I want to remind us of who we are in our family. Foundation. Our foundation is rooted in the gospel, the simple truth that you and I were created to know God and be in relationship with him, but our sin separates us from God. And yet God sent his one and only son, Jesus, to come to this world, to give his life, to, to heal us, to restore us, to, to build a bridge so that we could have relationships, so that we could know God the Father, so that we could be found in him. 
That simple truth is the truth that you and I build our lives on, the truth, the gospel that we have been entrusted with, and the gospel is, is something that we want to take to the world. It's the church's job to take the gospel to the world. And so we believe that the church is God's hope to redeem the world. We believe that our church has a specific mission and vision and calling. And so here are some of the things that we want to do in the next year. First, I, I want to say this. We have worked very hard over the last eight years of our church to establish a DNA, to establish a culture, to establish our vision. And so our vision is going to remain the same. We want to be a movement of people finding their way back to God. We want to see people take steps to be more like Jesus today than they were yesterday. That starts with a first-time decision, but that also starts with us saying goodbye and letting go to pieces of ourselves that are that are not in line with the life that Jesus would want for us. We see those things happen on Sunday mornings. We see those things happen in movement groups and as we serve, as we share our faith, and as we live on mission. And so I want you to know, first of all, that, that there will not be a time that Movement Church drastically changes. And what I mean by that is this. We believe in our vision and our values and our culture and our DNA. We want to keep the gospel footprint that we have established, but we want to see that grow and we want to see that uh, really just change as it, as, it, uh, as it grows in the community. We want to enhance and, and really grow that footprint. We are modern yet biblical. We're relationship driven. We're welcoming. We believe that at the core of us, we awaken people and we awaken leaders through biblical community. And so we're not just a church that wants to get people to show up. We want to see them invested in. We want to see them discipled. We want to see them living on purpose. And so we're going to maintain our DNA, but we're going to grow our footprint and grow our impact in the community this year. So here's some simple ways that you can be looking for and you can know how we're going to do that. We're going to be doing what we call a reveal study in the next couple weeks, next months. And that study is this. We're just going to ask, when is the last time you shared your faith? Are you in biblical community? Do you feel like you know scripture? When's the last time you prayed? If we're going to claim successes, we want to be able to have some more metrics. And so we're going to say to people, what do we know? Who are we? What are we living as a church? Out of that, we're going to make some decisions for our Sunday morning teaching series and other things because we want a church, we want to be a church that embodies the gospel. Another way that we want to be a church that embodies the gospel is we're going to keep up the evangelism uh, that we have promoted. We want to see every person in Movement Church share their faith once a month. That's 12 times a year. We want to see them bring five friends to church. That's five friends a year. We want to see them lead one friend to a relationship with Jesus. 12 by 5 by 1. Share your faith 12 times a year. Bring five friends to church. Lead one friend to Jesus. That's how we're going to embody the gospel this year. How are we going to engage in community? Well, we're going to take the DNA of what we've done, and like I said, we're, we're going to grow that. We were a church that started in a small classroom with two movement groups. We expanded to five and seven and nine and 14. Currently, we have 17 groups. We're going to be sending some of those groups with Contrast Church. And, and so in some ways, we think we might go back to 16 or 15. But here's our vision for next year. We want to grow to 21 movement groups. Now, we're not just saying that for fun. We want to grow to 21 movement groups because we believe that's the size of church that God is calling us to be in the next step. This isn't about people showing up on Sundays or making Sundays bigger. That happens when we create a home for people to be discipled and to be known and to be in biblical community. And so we want to grow our movement groups because that's how we grow the consistency and the engagement of people who attend and call us home on Sunday mornings. We believe with 21 movement groups, we'll be able to see nearly 400 people engaged in finding a home consistently in Movement Church. We also want to continue to be a church that empowers others, and here's what that's going to look like. We just mentioned that, that we want to be a church that multiplies. We're going to have some of our groups multiply. We're going to birth new groups. That's not always easy, but it's in our DNA, and it's a DNA that's focused on others. It's focused on people who are looking for a home and a place to connect and a place to grow. And so we want to be a church that multiplies. We want to be a church that sends. We're going to be sending Contrast Church after July as school gets started in the fall. And that's going to be significant, but we believe in that. And we believe in the footprint of planting churches all over the city. So we want to be a church that multiplies, that sends. And we're going to apprentice. There are some of you who might be saying, who's going to lead these new groups? 
Well, maybe it's you if you've been apprenticing. Maybe you're saying, who's going to apprentice? Who's going to be in these new groups? Maybe God is asking you to step out of your comfort zone, to do something that maybe scares you a little bit, but help others find community the way that you did when you came to movement. Maybe you could join one of these new groups or apprentice lead one of these groups or lead one of these groups because we want to be a church and we want to be a place where we empower others. We want to see people own their faith and own their church. And that's one of the biggest ways that you can do this in the next year. New leaders, new apprentice leaders, new groups, they lead to new growth. Well, there's one other question you might be asking, Mark, what's this going to cost? And here's, here's simply what, what we believe will make this happen. Last year, our budget was around $475,000. And this year, we believe that God is calling us to grow that to $560,000. I'm sure the video team is going to put a pie chart here and you'll be able to see the breakdowns. But honestly, know this, the percentages are, are basically the same they've always been. The same percentages going out the door to church planning, to our efforts in Haiti, to community projects and other things. Here are some of the, the major changes in this budget. We're going to be adding an operations coordinator position here around the office. Someone who can worry about some of the day-to-day -day tasks, help us to get more organized and, and grow in the things that have really gone beyond what volunteers can handle as far as bookkeeping and operations. And we believe that in the coming years, as we talk more and more about a building and a move and all those fun things that we know are on the horizon, that staff member will help us get to that point. We're also making a significant contribution to up our video budget and change some of the things that we do. We were doing this before coronavirus, and now this video church time has shown us that we want to be able to have a footprint that echoes on social media that people can see and in our services, whether they're in person or not. And so we're, we're upping the money that we've invested in video for that budget that's $560,000. Now, I don't say that to think that that's just going to happen. I know that that takes sacrifice and generosity on our part, but I know the trends and I know who we are as a church and I know what God is building. And I believe that we can pretty easily do that in the next year as God continues to grow us and grow our core and grow who we are as engaged people who are giving toward the mission and the vision and the values that God has called us to. If you have questions about that, feel free to, to look me up. My email's on our website to, to call the office. We'd love to talk to you more about that, but I hope you're behind what God is doing. You're feeling excited and called to be a part of what he's building here at Movement Church in this next year. Year. Well, hey, I want to say thank you for joining us this week at Movement Church. Uh, as always, we want to regularly practice the rhythm of giving. And so if you're someone who has financially supported our church or wants to do that as a discipline, I want to let you know that you can log on to our website, movementcolumbus.com, and you can click on the giving tab there. You can automate that. You can make that a regular pattern in your life. Hey, we've been getting a lot of questions with phase one and two rolling out uh, from our country and from the state, different things happening. And people are asking, hey, when are we going to meet again? I want to let you know and I want to be honest with you that we, we don't know the answer to that, but we know and we believe that it's coming and we see movement happening. And so uh, we're going to be listening to our government. We're going to be working with the Hilliard YMCA. And when we know more, we promise that you'll know more. There's a reality that there's going to be a week where we send out an email and it's going to happen. And so I want you to remember how you feel right now, how it feels that you want to meet. And remember that energy when we call you on a Thursday and we say, hey, we're allowed to meet this week. Can you volunteer? Can you serve this week? Remember the feeling right now and we'll use that for momentum going forward. Hey, I want to just uh, remind you one last time, if you go to our website, movementcolumbus.com, you can have replays of old messages. You can send those with friends and family, send them podcasts. We also have resources on there for kids. Uh, we have reading plans and all kinds of things. So check out our website on the COVID-19 uh, tab on that page, and we will see you again next week.